My favorite picture there is of the kitten looking in the mirror and seeing a lion. May the Lord today, through the mirror of his word, reveal to us who we really are in spite of what we think we are. John chapter 10, it's Hanukkah in this text. Hanukkah is the feast of dedication. It doesn't happen in the Old Testament, but in the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament, Israel was conquered by their enemies, and while under the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, the temple of God was defiled, the place of worship was made filthy, idolatry was allowed to exist within it, and debauchery happened in it. There was even the sacrifice of a pig, and pig's blood spread all around it. And so when the Israelites were able to regain possession of the temple, they cleansed it and rededicated it to the Lord. And during that time, they only had enough oil for one day to put in the golden candlesticks, and it lasted for eight days. It was a miracle. And so to commemorate that to this day, they celebrate with an eight-candlestick candelabra, even though the original candlestick had seven, they have with eight to commemorate those eight days. Christ comes to the temple on two occasions. He cleansed the temple of the idolatry of money that was happening there, the place of for Gentiles to attend and perceive them in their worship was taken over with merchandising and money changing and, and corruption was there. Romanized Jewish religious leaders had possession of it, had control of the priesthood, and Christ came and confronted the corruption and cleansed the temple on two different occasions. Here he comes into the temple and brings pure truth. Let's see how it goes. John 10, verse 22. Now, it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, or Hanukkah, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, These guys were not eager to find the Messiah. They were eager to try to disprove him as the Messiah because he didn't come in the package they wanted. They wanted their corruption defended and accepted. Jesus didn't come the way they thought he would come. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe that he was the the Christ, he was the Messiah. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So I've told you, you didn't believe me. Now look at the works, the things I'm doing, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, performing miracles, walking on water. I'm not your ordinary guy here. If you do not believe in my words, at least look at my works. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Can we say never? They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. As believers, we have security in the Father's hand. For centuries, people have debated, all right, if I'm in the Father's hand, can I get out? Well, why would you even want to think about getting out? To me, it is a useless argument. How many angels can sit on the head of a pen? As many as want to, I guess. To me, this ministers security to us in such a way that we can grow, we can trust his leadership, and when he corrects us, we can accept it. And embrace the packages he sends to us, even though we don't like the wrapping. He is our Father and he cares about us. Amen? Amen. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Now this is in the temple. It's a festival day. The thing is being cleaned, right? That's what you do with public places. There's a crew that comes in here and cleans on Saturday nights. You've got a crowd coming, you clean the place. 
there's, so there's not rocks laying around. These guys either ran out and found some, they had a pile waiting on them somewhere, or they came prepared. Oh, Jesus is there. And these rocks weren't little pebbles. They were rocks to hurt somebody with. They were just looking for an opportunity to hurt him. Well, Jesus, I love his sense of humor. He once again emphasizes his works. Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? You guys want to kill me. What's, what's the problem? Do you not like the blind seeing and the lame walking and the lepers being cleansed and restored to their families? Do you not like the hungry being fed? What's the problem? Which one was it that bothered you? Great humor. The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we do not stone you but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Leviticus 24 has this very harsh law that if someone blasphemes God, they are to be stoned until dead. But Christ wasn't blaspheming. He was telling the truth about himself. Their refusal to believe him created this scenario of blasphemy. So who's really blaspheming here? Jesus or those that refuse to believe him? They were the ones worthy of being stoned because they're denouncing God's Son. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Now, I love Jesus. Here he is confronting people, wanting to put him down, and he lifts them up. We're ready to stone you for blasphemy because you being a man make yourself God. Well, isn't it written in your law? There's a verse that says you are gods. And if the scriptures can't be broken, then why are you upset? that I say I am the Son of God. How many times when people try to put us down, cut us down, do we just return the favor? Jesus told us to agree with your adversary quickly, lest he take you to court. He was looking for a place to agree with them. If you ever have a chance to witness to a Muslim, know this. They like Christmas. They do believe Jesus was born of a virgin. So you've got something in common there to minister life. Look for an opening to bring life. So here Christ is confronted by people that want to cut him down, want to kill him, and he broadens the scope and includes them in this circle of friends and love. But they weren't having it. I remember a story of William Carey. He was a missionary to India, translated the Bible in numerous languages in the nation of India. And one day he was visited by some dignitaries, and one of them was rather a highly polished, prideful member of British aristocracy who said, William Carey, I understand that when you were back in England, you were just a shoemaker. William Carey's response was brilliant. He says, no, sir, I was not a shoemaker. I was just a shoe repairman. Agree with your adversary quickly. In this response is a message that I hope we glean, but I want to finish the text. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, what? The works of my Father. Though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And they sought again to seize him, but he escaped. He refers to his works six times. Why? Because he's pointing out their works in a subtle, humble, gentle way. Guys, I'm fulfilling my assignment. What are you doing with yours? Look at the passage he's quoting from Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. Can we say the mighty? He judges among the gods. Can we say the gods? 
The word there for gods is the word Elohim. It can be translated sometimes angels, can be translated other places magistrates. It's the word used to describe God in the first chapter of Genesis. When God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Speaking of himself in the plural, the word there for God is the word Elohim. God is so awesome he can call himself us. He's that big. We. Us. Elohim. And here humanity is included in that word. He stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. And this is what he says to these magistrates, to these people in authority, to these mighty ones. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah, which means take a break, think about it while the music plays. So here are these ones who are mighty. Here are these ones that have such God-likeness, they're called gods, little g, of course. And then they're confronted with this question, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? With God's esteem comes responsibility. Amen? And this is what they do. He's telling them to defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. And here's their condition of the poor and needy. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. Unfortunate circumstances happen to people all the time. And they need help. Well, we're not responsible for dinglings making bad decisions. Well, do you make good decisions every day of your life? Some people are one paycheck away from homelessness. Where's the mercy in the house? The mighty ones, those who are so godlike they're called gods, are convicted of being unjust and showing partiality to those who are wicked because they're not defending the poor and the fatherless, doing justice to the afflicted and needy. They're not delivering the poor and needy and freeing them from the hand of the wicked. And these people are in this condition, these needy people, because they don't know it. Lack of knowledge causes people to be destroyed. Sometimes they don't understand. They walk about in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are unstable. Economies are not stable. If gas goes down in price, it's good for some people and bad for others. If somebody comes through your neighborhood and busts out all the windows, it's horrible for you, but it's great for the glass company. It's that kind of world in which we live. Verse 6, I said, you are gods and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. You're human. You're going to experience death. But yet you have a position of authority. What makes them gods? They're children of the Most High. They're not the Most High God, capital G. They're gods, little g, children of the Most High, capital G, capital O, capital D. You with me? And then the psalmist declares... Verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. In my heart, I sense a parallel between this passage and Isaiah 61 that Jesus gave as his mission statement in his hometown. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, bring deliverance to the captive, the recovery of sight to the blind, the Healing of those that are diseased and oppressed. You read all of Isaiah 61. It's what Jesus is all about. And ultimately, it leads to his inheritance of all the nations. Israel was called to be a light to the nations, and they weren't. They were a light to themselves. And they had a victim mentality because Rome was dominating them. And they wanted a Messiah to come and affirm everything they had going on religiously and to free them from the Roman Empire so that their corruption could be more free to operate. The Messiah came, but he didn't come like that. He came to lift them up in the midst of their struggles to bring salvation to them so that his kingdom, not theirs, could expand. I'm speaking to you today on the subject, 
You are God's. Little g. Say what? Stay with me. If you don't, if you take one statement out of context, you'll leave here believing something that's not true. Like Pastor Allen is whacked. <laughs> you are gods. In what way are we gods? And what for are we gods? How are we gods? And why? You want to know? We are gods by being God's children. We just read Psalms 82.6. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. This is a scripture Jesus quoted, and he quoted it as unbreakable scripture. He emphasized it. Some would water this down and say, no, he means you are magistrates. Well, look at the context. Why would he bring up that verse then? It was just meaning they're magistrates. They're accusing him as blasphemy for saying he is God. They want to kill him. He quotes this verse that wouldn't relate. It does relate. Why does it say in your law, I said you are Elohim? It's exactly the way he he meant it. He called it an unbreakable scripture. We are God's children. John 1 verse 12 says, As many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. We say God's children. Romans 8.16 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. 1 John 3, one says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. We understand God is our Creator. We understand He's our Maker. And through that, we understand He's our Father. But He's not our Father in the sense that He's a pet owner. Some people have pets and they call them their children. we got two poodles. They're our kids. They're not really your kids. They're not the same species. They're not, you know, they're nothing like you. They're your great friends, though. They are your best friends. You know how to tell your dog's your best friend? Lock him in the truck with your spouse for three hours and then let both of them out and see which one's the quickest at showing you some love. I am Samuel Allen Latta because my father was Samuel Latta. You are who you are because your father and mother, your parents, were who they are and were. You can make something, but you can't really create anything. You can build something, but you can't really start from scratch. It's another funny story I heard where somebody challenged God to a creation contest. Said, God, I can make gold out of dirt too. God said, Really? Yeah. Okay, do it. Well, I gotta get some dirt. He says, Get your own. <laughs> you might build a watch, you might build a car, and be called a car maker or a watchmaker, but you are not a car father or a watch father. See that? If God is your father, you are his child. There's God-likeness in you. That's why we're called to walk in our godliness. The original sin was for humanity to believe a lie, doubt the integrity of God's word, which included doubting who they were. They were told what fruit not to eat of, and they were tempted to eat of that fruit because of this lie. And the lie said, God's holding out on you, He doesn't want you to eat of it because the day you eat of it, you'll be like him. The opposite was true. They were already like him. If they ate of it, they would cease to be like him. They would, death would enter their experience. God never dies. We die. Something happened. We fell from our godlikeness by becoming temporal beings. You with me? And so, the temptation was to eat of the fruit so they could be like God when they were already like God. The advertising world works like this. To tempt you to believe something about what you have as not being adequate enough. Maybe you just had a break, just came back from a vacation, some commercial comes on, aren't you tired? Aren't you weary? We have the perfect mattress for you. Oh, I'm exhausted. We're so vulnerable to temptation to believe things about ourselves that are not true. 
All right. How else are we God's? We're children of God. We also are God's righteousness. It's been bestowed upon us. Second Corinthians 5.21, talking about Jesus, says, He, God, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. I've checked various translations. There is no variation on this. We are, in Christ, God's righteousness. That's a characteristic that all of creation does not have. We have it in Christ. How are we God's? We are righteous like God is. In fact, the righteousness isn't like God's. It's God's righteousness. We've been born of God, Peter wrote, of incorruptible seed. Born again of incorruptible seed, which lives and abides forever. We are God's because we are promised eternal life. God is eternal. We are made eternal. Our fallenness has been remedied through Christ taking the fall for us. We now have an eternal relationship with Him. When you die, it's just your body, not your soul and your spirit. We are alive forever. John 10, we just read this. Jesus talked about his sheep. He said, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's close to God. How close are we to God? We know we're so close that he gave his son for us, right? And we know he thinks loving things about us. But how much does he think about us? It's as numerous as the grains of sand in the sea. God's thoughts about you. This is a single grain of sand. There are approximately 3,037 grains of sand in a teaspoon. A cup contains approximately 3,614,981,715 grains of sand. The Bible says God thinks about you a lot. In fact, if you were to try to count all the thoughts God has about you, it would outnumber all the grains of sand. Now that is a lot of thinking. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more than the number in the sand. Psalm 139, 17. We've talked a little bit about how we are God's, being His children, His righteousness, and eternal creatures. But why? What for? Number one, we've been made in God's image to represent Him, to represent Him to a world that has lost touch with Him, to represent God. In Exodus 4, when God assigns Aaron to serve with Moses, in verse 16, he tells Moses that he would be to Aaron as God. In Exodus 7, verse 1, he told Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. Moses was God's representative. If Pharaoh listened to Moses, it would be as though he was listening to God. Jesus told us in Matthew 10:40, He who receives you, receives me. He who receives me, receives him who sent me. This is what we call power of attorney. Someone that's empowered with authority to act on behalf of someone else. Let's say you're going to take a long trip and you've got a car for sale and you instruct a friend, hey, if a buyer shows up, I'm going to give you this power of attorney to sign the title in my place. 
It's legally binding if you're given a power of attorney for someone that your signature becomes as good as a person's signature that gave you the power of attorney. To act in your place or to act in their place. So it is with us. We've been made gods to act in God's place, capital G, of course. Why would he leave such a task in the hands of cockroaches? Or dinglings? Or robots? We've been made in his image to embrace the assignment he has for us, which includes representing him. Which means when you bless someone, God is blessing them through you. You're working for God. Right? That's what godly people do, godlike people do. Why are we gods? We're gods to serve people in need. We read this from Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Verse 3, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. There's another verse that talks about pure religion. To keep oneself unspotted from the world and to visit widows and orphans in their distress. Serving needy people is what we are about. And we do it in God's place. We do it to represent God. And we are God's because we are becoming like Him. We've been redeemed, but yet there's a change coming where it's going to become more obvious. We're going to get glorified bodies. First John 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God. Now. Can we say now? Now. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. So we're living in the now, looking for the not yet. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. This is what Paul talked about when he talked about the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation is groaning for this day. Verse 3 goes on to say, Everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. Embrace your God-likeness. It is humbling and it is responsibility. If we think we're losers, we'll just accept things as they are and develop a fatalistic outlook on life. And do nothing. And one day we're going to stand before the master asking us, what did you do with the things I gave you as stewards to be over? What did you do with the gifts, the talents, the opportunities I extended to you? Well, I was just a poor little old human. No, you're not a poor little old human. C.S. Lewis said, no one has ever talked to a mere human. We're not mere humans. We are humans. It's important to keep that in mind. But you've been created in the image of God. You're a child of God. And you have an eternal destiny. This is not artificial. This is real. We live in a world that attempts to present itself in ways that are false. It's like shining the brass on a sinking ship. What in the world is that about? Embrace who you are and... Pursue the calling God has given us. It was really interesting to hear what the famous actress said. She was commenting on some glamorous photos of herself and she said, That doesn't look like me at all. I love Photoshop more than anything in the world. And then she added, People don't look like that. The photos were actually a lie, presenting an image of the young lady that only exists on a computer. And what happens is that some people, often young and impressionable, see those pictures and want to be like that actress or that model, yet never can be, because not even the person in the photo looks like the person in the photo. Many people are trying to live up to someone else's ideal of beauty or femininity or masculinity for that matter. People even develop eating disorders, or they feel lousy about themselves because of what society tells them they should look like or act like or own. But you know something? When we really understand who we are, we'll put ourselves under a lot less of that kind of pressure. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now hold it right there. We are what? 
the children of God. Who can possibly have self-image issues when they know in their heart that they're a true child of God, a member of heaven's royal family? It isn't wrong to do your very best to look good, to achieve well, but when your entire self-worth is bound up in how you look and whether or not you look like the in crowd, that's really unhealthy and unnecessary. No matter how you look or what others think of you, rejoice today because you are a child of God. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. You're God's child. You're beautiful. Do not allow the world with its falsehoods to give you an idea of what you're supposed to be. I read the other day that people are starting to think that Barbie's ankles are too fat. I mean, it's shifting sands. Values just change left and right. Meanwhile, you are God's. Say what? Live in what you were created for. For what you were created to do. Can we stand? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would enable us to embrace our godlikeness and to live in godliness to show your love where opportunities are ours. Lord, may we not be self-centered gods like are displayed in Greek mythology, but Lord, may we be children of the Most High doing our part to serve fallen humanity everywhere we go. In Jesus' name. In this room are people that need prayer. People that might not say they have fallen, but they're just people that need some prayer. They need somebody. Have you ever been where you need somebody to pray with you? So I'd like to end the service by, you know, if you've got to go, you're free to go. Don't want anybody forced to do this unless they're, you know, if you're uncomfortable with this, you don't have to do it. It's fine. But if you're comfortable with this, I'd like for us to form circles of three or four or five people. Any more than that would take too long for everybody to receive prayer. But just turn to people around you and say, hey, let's pray together. What can I pray with you about? If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Can we do that right now? Just do that. Close the service with prayer circles all over the auditorium. See someone stand alone, go invite them to be in your circle. You do that. You are so beautiful to me. Oh!